Father in heaven, we want to thank you that this is your word. It's living, it's active. It's able to do beyond what we could think or imagine in each of our life. And yet we need you, Holy Spirit. We need you to breathe afresh upon us this morning. We need you to be the teacher, the counselor, the helper that you are. And so come, sweet Spirit, you who reside in us, the third person of the Trinity, the Godhead. We need you now. Change us from the inside out. Transform our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Beloved, as we're looking at 2013 and now we've stepped into 2014, I was just wondering how we're doing. You know, your, your first initial steps into the new year, how are you feeling about it? Are you, are you fresh? You know, are you tackling the new year with, with zest? And then when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the 10th standard students. You know, I was thinking about the 10th standard students, the, the parents. Um, how are you doing? H has your level of stress gone up or has it come down? Well, the boards are right there around the corner, so I'm assuming that maybe the stress level has gone up. For some of you, you might have carried some of your trials and circumstances into 2014, and so there is stress. There are difficulties that have come with you still unsure about things, decisions to be made, confusion, needing more clarity. And beloved, when we take these initial steps into the new year, if our focus is on the circumstances and what's going on in our life, we can actually miss, we can fully miss what Jesus is trying to say into us. He wants to help us. He wants to empower us. He wants to strengthen us. But if our eyes are on that which is causing stress and turmoil, we can miss what he's trying to say. It happens, beloved. It, it happens in Luke. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 12. I want you to see how this happens so easily in each of our lives. Luke chapter 12 actually starts out with Jesus in the height of his ministry with the crowds coming in and it says actually literally it says there were the masses of people that were, had gathered to hear him and it says they were literally stepping on one another they were literally stepping on one another you might have experienced this at the Mumbai railway station have you ever been stepped on before the, the crowd comes in now I've never ridden the rail uh, the, the, the train here in Mumbai but I've done in Kolkata and I've been literally lifted off my feet because of the crowd and almost shoved out of the compartment where I was actually hanging on. I think you, I think you were there watching all of this, Candy, but it was something. I mean, tr truly lifted up. So we can kind of get a little bit of what the masses are like. These masses have come in, and Jesus is giving a teaching to the disciples. And he starts off by saying this, beware. Beware of the Pharisees, the, the, the leaven of the Pharisees. You know, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the ones who you respect, the ones that you are receiving teaching from, beware, because that, that leaven is actually called hypocrisy. They are teaching you to do things and to step into these things, but they themselves are not willing to do. They are putting a yoke around you that they are not acting upon. Beware of that. And why is he saying that? Because we're all susceptible of that kind of leaven. We're all susceptible of trying to put on our best foot for of looking the part, aren't we? To look the part of the Christian. What we perceive in our mind to be Christian, we say, you know what, I want that image to be projected out. And yet when the door shuts, we know that's not what's really there. And that's what Jesus is saying. Be careful. Be beware of that kind of leaven from the Pharisees because we can each step into it. And then he goes on though, beloved, to, to give a teaching on, you know what, don't worry about men killing your body. Be fearful of the one who can kill both soul and body. Fear God, he says. Walk with God, and as you walk with God, know that you're going to be persecuted, he goes on to say. But in the midst of the persecution, and when, when people are challenging you in your faith, know that in that time, words will be given to you to defend your faith. Important teachings and important encouragement to the body of Christ. And yet, out of the midst of this teaching, in verse 13, it says this. Someone in the crowd 
said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Get that. He's talking on perseverance. He's talk, talking on don't fear man. And yet out of nowhere comes this question. Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance properly. The teaching's just gone right over this man. He's not even thinking about the teaching of Jesus, is he? He's thinking about what's going on in his own life, and he can't see beyond it. And beloved, if we're not careful, when we take these initial steps into 2013, whatever is pressing in on us, we can be like this man who, who missed it altogether. What Jesus is trying to say to help us, to strengthen us, if our, if our mind is only on that, we'll miss it. We'll miss him in the midst of it. And yet he doesn't ignore him. I'm assuming, and I'm sure that with the, the masses there, there are so many other people speaking things to Jesus. And yet he stops to address this one man. Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Tell, this is the man's pain and problem. His brother. If he has this issue, he's also dealing with another kind of pain, isn't he? He's, he's lost a loved one. He's dealing with uh, probably the loss of his dad. The inheritance has come because someone has died who is dear to him. So he's not only dealing with the mourning aspect, but the one who is supposed to have his back, the one who is supposed to love him, has taken the inheritance from him. And yet in that pain, he says, Teacher, Tell him to do what is right. Isn't that like some of our prayers too? If it's a relational conflict that's going on, we're constantly saying, Jesus, fix my spouse. Jesus, fix this for me. Jesus, change that person who's, who's causing the pain. Jesus, my spouse is not loving me enough. Change that person. Jesus, my spouse, isn't respecting me. Change him or her. Jesus, change my boss who's not giving me the promotion. Jesus, change the circumstances. And we're wanting Jesus to come in and change something, but yet when we're actually speaking to Jesus, the way that he responds to us many times is so different than how we want or we're looking forward to. Jesus' response is a, with a question. I want you to get this. His response when the man says, change my brother, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance, the response of Jesus is, man, who made me judge or arbiter? Who made me the one who, who sits in judgment to make the decision in this case? What does a judge do? A judge is someone who, who listens to the evidence, makes a decision on the evidence, and that decision has authority and power to be acted out, doesn't it? An arbiter is someone who handles the, law, uh, to the, the land disputes. And so probably in this case we can say that there's an issue with the land, the property. Beloved, when I was looking at this passage, I'm thinking, you know, how many Christians, whether in, in the U.S. or in India, have I ministered to who have had similar situations? Maybe some of you in here have, have known this kind of pain very specifically, where some, a loved one has not been fair in their dealings with property. And it's painful, because that loved one is supposed to be one who loves you and who takes care Man, who made me judge or arbiter of, over you? It's an interesting question. Because often we don't want to see Jesus as judge, not until we have to stand before the judge. See, the man, Jesus is trying to say, listen to the man, do you really know who you're standing before? You, you're calling me teacher. And see, you know what with a teacher? A teacher is one who gives instruction. A teacher is one who teaches, but with a teacher, you and I can listen to the instruction, and then you and I can choose whether we're going to listen or whether we're going to reject the instruction. You and I can listen to an instruction and say, you know what, I think I know a better way. Right? We do that with the Bible, don't we? 
We can listen to the word of God. And if we see Jesus, if we come to Jesus in this new year as teacher only, we're going to pick and choose the scriptures that we like. And we're going to reject the ones that cause us maybe turmoil. The scripture that says, Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's a scripture that we're going to receive and we're going to run to Jesus for that rest. But the scripture that tells us, love your enemies. Well, okay Lord, I'll love these enemies, but these enemies are not right now. We tend to pick and choose what scriptures we like and don't like. Why? Beloved, because we see Jesus as only a teacher. What Jesus is challenging this man on is what we need to be challenged on in this 2014. We many times don't want to see Jesus as judge. As the one who, who makes a decision and has authority to carry it out in our life. The judge who's, who looks at us and says, this is going on in your life. This is the judgment, but I am good, right? I am holy, but I'm good, I'm kind, I'm merciful. To come under that system of justice is a good thing, beloved. But in Christendom throughout, many times we want to try to, we're trying to get this understanding of Jesus out of the church. We're wanting to only see him as the shepherd and the teacher and the one who is, who is there to nurture us. But beloved, the one who is the judge over us is also there to look after us. Amen? He's there to show us the right way to go. And so the question is a very poignant question that he's asking the man. Man, who appointed me judge or arbiter over you? Do you really want me to enter in? And then he does. Verse 15, he says, listen. Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. In that one verse, beloved, there is so much meat. He begins with saying, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. When we're looking at this passage, we only see one form of greed, don't we? It's the brother who cheated the other brother. It's the brother who took the inheritance for himself and didn't give to his brother. But beloved... The question that Jesus always points to is why are you so insistent on getting the inheritance for yourself? Well, Jesus, it's my right. It's my right, Jesus, to have that inheritance. Why do you want it so desperately? See, why did this man not come to Jesus and say, Jesus, would you help me love my brother while he's cheating me? Well, we don't pray that. Jesus, help me to, to find reconciliation. Jesus, would you help me to forgive? And yet this brother in his pain is saying, what is right needs to come to me. He says, be careful of every form of greed that exists. The Greek word for greed literally means every form of covetousness. Every form of covetousness. That's why greed and sexual, uh, sexual immorality are often combined together. Now, there is a movie that's come out, and I do not suggest you going to see it. It's called The Wolf of Wall Street. Have you all heard about the movie? Don't see it. Okay? It's like high up on the profanity scale. I would not recommend it. But it's a true story about a man who started off very low, and see, greed doesn't know its socioeconomic boundaries. Greed starts in the lower stratum of the socioeconomic scale, and greed is at the top. But there's no end. He started off small, but he was always wanting more and more and more. And there was no end to this man's greed, where he started cheating people, and he started taking from people, and he started to live a life of sex and drugs, and where it completely destroyed him, and went, he went through two marriages. And now there's a movie out on this man's life and we are being entertained by watching the movie. We are being entertained by watching a movie on greed. And, and as I've read the reviews, it's like the whole review is like when you go watch the movie, you're actually rooting for him. You're, you're against the FBI. But you're wanting him to, ah, oh, I wish he could, you know, make it. What is that within us that wants to be entertained by that dark side of life? It says, beware of every form of greed. It can be our ruin. But then he goes on to say here, 
For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. I want you to underline a word for me. It's the word life. Underline the word life. It says, right here, it says, not even one who has abundance does the life consist of his possessions. The problem often that we have, beloved, is our life does consist of our possessions. And yet Jesus here, he is saying, it doesn't. It's not real. And the problem that we have when we're reading this is that we only have one word for life in the English language. It's life. But in the Greek, there are three different words for life that mean life. But the first word that we have in the Greek, and we, uh, we had this message two or three years ago, but the, the one word that we have for life is the bios life. And the bios life that, that is mentioned in, in the scriptures is a, a life that starts at birth until death. And it involves all of our material possessions. That's the bios life. The bios life would be the clothes that you are wearing. It's considered the bios life. It's the rings that you have. It's your iPad. It's your smartphone. That's the bios life. It's all of our material possessions. Beginning and end. There's also the pasuke life that scripture talks about. And the pasuke life has to do with our soul life. That involves our thought life. It involves our, our emotions as well as our will and desire. And then there's the third kind of life. And it's called the Zoe life. And it's the Zoe life here that Jesus is talking about. He says, when one has an abundance, does his life, uh, even when one has an abundance, does his life consist of his possessions? It does not. He's talking about a Zoe life. And the only time the Zoe life is mentioned is every time we have eternal life. When Jesus says in John 14, 6, I came that you may have life and have it abundantly, John 10, 10, that's the Zoe life. In John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the Zoe life. And yet, beloved, in our life, as I was reading this scripture, the, the word that kept coming to me, as we take these initial steps into 2014, what kind of life are we centering our steps on? Is it the Bios life? Is that, that, is that what has our focus this morning? Is it the Pasuke life? Or is it the Zoe life? The Zoe life that is in the, in the person of Jesus Christ. That's where many Christians, where many of us, we get confused. That's where many of us have our issues and our problems because we don't understand the type of life that Jesus is actually offering. He gives a parable, beloved, starting in verse 16 to kind of make the point. He says this, listen, there, there was a, a land of a rich man which was very productive. Land of a rich man, very productive, very fruitful. And he began reasoning to himself. He began reasoning to himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? That word reasoning to himself means he started having a dialogue with himself. How many of y'all have a dialogue with yourself? Have you ever dialogued with yourself? You are right now. Hmm, I wonder where I'm going to eat after the service. I wonder what we're going to do the rest of the day. I wonder what my kid needs to do, what subject he needs to study. There's a dialogue that's constantly going on in your mind. We constantly talk to ourselves. We just don't want to admit it to anyone. This rich man started having a dialogue. What am I going to do with this incredible production? Okay? As he dialogues, this is what I'm going to do. He comes up with the idea. This is what I will do. This is what I'm going to set in motion. I'm going to tear down my small barns. I'm going to build bigger barns. And I'm going to fill the bigger barns and store them. That's my idea. That's, what, that's how I'm going to start living my life. Storing up. Storing up. Why am I doing this? Verse 19. And I will say to my soul, I want you to underline that, beloved. I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. The steps of this rich man was for his soul. 
How can I bring happiness? How can I bring ease? How can I bring comfort to my soul? Well, I'm going to focus on the bios life. I'm going to focus on the fruit, on all the production. I'm going to build the barn and store it for myself so that my soul can be at ease. So that my will, my emotions, my thoughts can be at ease. As I was looking at this passage, I'm thinking, okay, God, how are we going to order our steps differ differently than this man? The question came to me as a parent. And as parents, I want you to ask yourself, don't we say as parents, we want our children to have a better life than we had? Yes? Amen? I want my, my son, my daughter to have a better life than I had. The question then should come, what kind of life are we talking about? Are we talking about, we're wanting for our kids a better life in the bios for their pasuke to be at ease. So that our pasuke could be at ease. Is the Zoe life of Jesus Christ ever involved, beloved, when we say, I want my child to have a better life? See, as we enter into this 2014, it's the question, I believe, is how are we ordering our steps? You know, we, we, we entered in with watch night service and praise and worship, but the concern is, do, do we go back? Everything that weighs heavy on us, does it have to do with the bios? Everything that's weighing heavy on us, does it have to do with trying to get our soul at ease? To where one day we can store up and say, ah, oh, I can eat and drink and I can be merry. And yet Jesus is saying, there's no Zoe life in that. He goes on to say, in verse 20, this is the hard word that can come to us and that we need to receive. God said to him, you fool. You fool. No one likes to be called a fool. Especially when you have invested so much in. And yet... God says to that rich man and to each one of us, if that's where we've ordered our footsteps, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? Who will own what you have prepared? You know what? I think we have an answer for that. You know what we say? My children. My children will own what I have prepared. But beloved, does that give ease to their soul? Does that... Is that involved the Zoe life of Jesus Christ where there is eternal life? We have a quick answer for Jesus in reply to this. Is it the way that he's calling us to walk, beloved? Verse 21, he says, So is the man who stores up treasure for himself. So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. See, there's a difference. In, in the kingdom of God, beloved, in the very kingdom that we're after, there is a different way of looking at things. And there is a richness within the kingdom of God that isn't necessarily rich the way that we are seeing and perceiving things. This man who was wanting Jesus to, to be the judge and to make the decision, he was perceiving where he could find his, e his soul at ease. And it was by his brother changing. And Jesus was trying to say, no, 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 for, for everyone, to all the disciples, to all those, in the, no, this is wrong. It's the wrong way of looking at things. It's the wrong way of living. There's no ease in this way of living. There's, there's turmoil. There's a, there's a vicious cycle of unease, actually. But then he goes on in verse 22, all the way down, he starts talking about, listen, I, I want to put your hearts at ease. He says, listen, look at the bird's Look at the lilies. Look at God's creation. You don't need to worry about these things. As disciples of mine who are walking after me, if you just start looking at creation, how I take care of so many things, will I not so much more take care of you? So seek first the kingdom. But then Jesus speaks so beautifully here in verse 31, in verse 32, where he says, in verse 32, Do not be afraid, little flock. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. 
See, for some of you right now, you need to hear that, that, that word from the Father. Do not be afraid. Why he's saying that is to step out into the Zoe life of living, to, to trust in this Jesus who we say has saved us and to be our Lord, it's going to require a, a faith walk. And in that faith walk, the voices are going to come and they're going to say, you fool. The voices are going to come and say, what are you doing? How are you living this way? Don't be afraid, little flock. Because it was your fa the Father is so glad to have chosen to give you the kingdom. See, there's a sense of ownership here, beloved. Many of us don't understand that we have an ownership within the kingdom of God. Some of us are still living as though we're slaves in the kingdom and that we're not sons and daughters of the king. And yet it says that it's the, that the, Jesus, that, that the Father was glad to have chosen to give in us the kingdom. That is to be a word to encourage us to live differently. It was to be a word to, to exhort us to be a people set apart. That we don't live for our own little kingdoms here on this earth. But we live for the kingdom to come. That should be a change of mindset in this 2014 year, beloved. How do we take these steps? Verse 33, are you ready? Verse 33, here's how to take these steps. Are you, are you, are you ready to receive this? Sell. Can, can we read it together? Sell your possessions and give to charity. No way, God. I don't like this scripture. This needs to be thrown out. This is where we have a hard, part, hard time to it, right? There's got to be a cultural significance. Surely Jesus isn't putting that on me for the Zoe life. This is where we would like to remove, right? This is where we would like to ignore. And yet in this, there is God. Sell your possessions. Why possessions? It's the bios life. Sell your possessions and give to charity. What is charity? The, the Greek word for charity is pity or mercy. It's to show those in need. Help those who are in need. Sell your possessions. Give to the ones who are in need. Because you're no longer living for this kingdom here. And we see it worked out. We see it worked out in Zacchaeus' life. When Zacchaeus comes to know the Savior, when he comes to know the King of Kings, the first thing that he does, he starts giving his possessions, doesn't he? We see it in the New Testament life. When the Holy Spirit invades the church, the church explodes. The first thing that we see amongst the saints, they start selling their property and their possessions and giving to everyone who has need. It's within the DNA of God. It's part of who the Father is. How do we see this worked out with the Father? This right here, beloved. This right here. We've come today to, to take part in this Lord's Supper. This right here represents extravagant giving. If we think this is too difficult, look at this, beloved. If we think selling the, the, uh, 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 an iPad or a, or a computer to help someone else, look at this right here, beloved. If we say this is going to hurt, look at this, beloved. Let us, let us think upon this morning the extravagant giving of the Father. When He looked at our sinfulness. When He looked at, at, at us turning away from Him and He said, I love them. And He looked to His Son and He said, go. Bleed for them. You've got to pay the penalty. You've got to suffer. You've got to die. That's extravagant. See, and when the Holy Spirit comes into the Christian, it changes everything. Because this has, this has done everything for us. And so the possessions that we have and hold, we say, you know what? I don't really need this anymore. But I see someone else who needs it. I, I, hey, I have some property over here. I'm going to sell it to make sure that you're helped. Beloved, that's, this is very unknown. We call it radical. We, we call this radical, don't we? And yet it's normal. 
within the, 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 the heart of a Christian who is spirit-filled. It's the normal. It's the new normal, beloved, because of this. Extravagant love. Extravagant giving. See, this challenges me. When I think about my kids, what kind of life do I want for my children? When I say life, what do I mean? Do I, do I mean the Zoe life? And a life that is stepping in and saying, you know what, I'm going to be extravagant. With the bios things that have been given to me. My soul is at ease, not because of the bios. My soul is at ease because I've been bought by the precious blood of Christ. That's what causes my soul to be at ease today. Rest for my soul because of Christ. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. As we take this Lord's Supper, beloved, my prayer for us as we take these steps into 2014, that we would allow this grace that has been given to us to transform our lives, to become extravagant givers, extravagant in our life because we're living and walking out in the Zoe life.